Welcome to Stories After Midnight. Today we'll be reading a viewer submitted story called Ring of Roses by Jarrett. I hope you enjoy it, and a huge shout out to my patrons for helping make this episode possible. Let's get started. The horror of Florence Ellis began on the second floor of the Pembroke Estate, overlooking the streets of Tottenham, England. The gardens below blossomed and you could smell the freshly trimmed boxwood hedges if you kept your window cracked and the wind was cooperative. The sidewalks bustled with foot traffic during the day, and if you ever found yourself bored, you could glance out your window and always be entertained. Tottenham wasn't a poor area, nor was it wealthy. An honest kind of person made their living in Tottenham. You did honest work for honest pay, and if you fell on hard times, you'd be looked after by your neighbors. They were like a safety net waiting to catch you, yet Florence managed to fall through. She lived alone and lacked the social equalities that would make any meaningful friends. She had an invisible wall around her that cut her off from the outside world, and the wall was so thick and sturdy that you couldn't penetrate it no matter how hard you tried. At the precipice of 30, she had never married and hadn't even had a real boyfriend. She struggled to connect to men on any meaningful level, finding most of them too controlling or simplistic or addicted to sex. She had an hourglass figure yet did not believe it, so wore tight dresses and corsets to cinch her waist. She thought herself short and stunted, so wore stilettos so high, upon a glance other women might cower away, nursing sore feet and feeling a strange kind of pity for her. She did her short blonde hair in a voluminous bouffant, and wore copious amounts of makeup to try to make up for perceived ugliness. She lacked the work ethic to move up at her job and, as such, found herself stagnant and miserable and working dreadfully long hours to make ends meet, spending most of her time either grinding away for meager pay or daydreaming. On this particular day, she was doing the latter, staring out at a dreary overcast day, the day the horror began. The clouds formed a shroud of gloomy melancholy that crept into the walls of her apartment. The young woman cradled her chin in her hand and sipped a stale cup of tea. She rolled it around over her tongue and decided to keep drinking it despite its repugnant flavor. It was the worst tasting tea she had ever brewed, and yet she found herself at the bottom of her cup. Rain pelted the windows and the wind howled in ferocious gusts that made her feel sorry for the poor blokes outside braving the elements. Her eyes drifted downwards, spotting a young girl's umbrella upended and turned inside out, the handle tugging her along like an overly energetic dog pulling at its leash. The girl's dress was old-fashioned and looked strange, like a lost time traveler. Florence chuckled softly at the ridiculous sight. She placed her cup down on the wide windowsill with its chipped white paint and picked up a novel, her bookmark sticking up well past the halfway point. The book was a fun, flirty romance, the perfect contrast to such a glum day. She settled herself back in the rich confines of her burgundy leather armchair the aged upholstery creaking loudly as she tucked her legs up underneath her. She lit a cigarette and began to read as the rain intensified its barrage on the glass. An hour passed, the pages whizzed by and she found herself becoming drowsy. The cozy warmth of the thick cushion didn't help matters, so she placed the book down, the bookmark now showing only a small sliver left, and rose from the chair. Her stomach growled. She stretched her arms out over her head in a loud yawn, as she strolled over to the record player, a cheap model with a built-in mono speaker. She removed the vinyl from the jacket and dropped the stylus onto a hard day's night. Lennon's energy was infectious as Florence danced into the kitchen. A ray of late afternoon sunlight broke the cloud cover and sent a streak of burnt orange into the apartment. Her hands were lost in the cuffs of her sweater as she grabbed a pan from the cabinet and placed it on the stovetop. She spritzed the pan with a dash of olive oil and turned up the heat. Swinging her hips back and forth, she twirled over to the refrigerator and pulled out the raw chicken breast she had seasoned the night before. The porcelain plate was chilled and she carried it over to the now warm pan and dropped the meat into it. The sizzle cut through the air as the song ended. Placing the plate down into the sink, she pumped soap into her palm and washed her hands under running water. I should have known better, began playing from the living room. Florence disliked the song and found the harmonica annoying and shrill, so changed the record. She found the kinks, more to her liking, and began roasting asparagus in the oven as a side dish. 
The sunlight had vanished by the time her dinner was ready. Sunset began morphing the overclassed clouds from a dull gray to a velvety twilight. She plated her chicken and asparagus, poured herself a glass of crisp white Bordeaux, and snatched up her book from where she had left it resting on the windowsill. She sat down at her modest dining room table, the wood rough and bumpy under her tablecloth. She tried to read but found juggling it with eating too difficult, so closed it and set it aside. She looked up at the empty chair across from her and heaved a depressed sigh, feeling her good mood crumble, wishing she had someone to share her meal with. She wound the curls of her hair in between her fingers, her appetite vanishing. She stared down at her seared chicken and picked it up with her fork, chewing small bites without any hint of enthusiasm. It tasted good, but the flavor failed to register. She hated this part of herself, the wild ups and downs of her thoughts. It felt like a roller coaster. The mood swings had always bothered Florence, but especially now since her episodes were beginning to affect her job. She worked as a hairdresser at a local hair salon, and customers had begun to complain about her lack of amiability. She was gruff and generally unhappy, and this radiated off of her and onto other people. She had no way to resist sorrow and never felt an iota of shame. Or first, she would have to have some semblance of self-esteem. It was a vicious cycle and not one that was easily broken. She felt lonely and isolated from the outside world, from society at large. She relished moments of joy, of true happiness. Yet the instances were so rare that she never expected them. They struck at random and surprised her so much that oftentimes she would be seen laughing to herself like a crazy person. She would get looks and bewildered stares. She internalized these and, as a result, found herself even more ostracized from normal, well-meaning people. She didn't belong amongst the masses and knew it. Maybe it's me, she thought as she nibbled at her asparagus. I deserve to be alone. I'm not normal. I can't hold down a conversation. I don't look as pretty as other women. I'm a failure. Florence the failure, or maybe Florence the mess up. There we go. That's my new name. Florence the mess up. Feeling depressed, she picked up the glass of wine and pressed the rim to her lips and drank. Her throat worked as she downed the entire glass in one loud gulp. That was good. Oh, so very good. And she surprised herself by laughing. She poured herself another heaping glassful and drank another down the hatch. A radiant warmth infused her cheeks and she began to feel dizzy. Another glass. She guffawed at the ceiling. Was that three or four glasses? Who knew? She felt wonderful again, euphoric. Why had she felt so crappy? It didn't matter. All negativity had been washed away, replaced by jubilation. The alcohol flooded her bloodstream and she felt alive and invigorated. Any man would be lucky to find her. She was just holding out for the right one. She was desired. Hell, men should be clawing down her door. That's right. Florence Ellis, the hottest commodity in London. Not just that, but the sexiest woman in all of Europe. The sickly sweet smell of wine clung to her like one of those obnoxious ants at Thanksgiving. She tried pouring more, but only drops remained. They fell from the bottle and splattered on the tablecloth, shaking her head to clear her blurred vision. She rose from the table and stumbled into the living room leaning on the wall for support. The kink's record was still spinning in the player, so she pressed the power button and the rotation ceased. She thought it stopped, but the record started to turn again, so she pressed the power button once more. The record kept spinning, so she shrugged, feeling a jolt of pain ripple through her. The rain resumed its torrential downpour, and flashes of lightning cast the night sky ablaze in purple brilliance. Florence glanced across the room, her head throbbing with every beat of her heart. She shut her eyes and allowed the pain to ebb away. When the pain subsided, she opened them and saw something off with the room. A burst of color, a strange object sitting by her window. Whatever it was hadn't been there a few seconds ago, or had it. She couldn't be certain, nor could she make it out through her drunken stupor. Getting closer to it proved to be a challenge, but she fought through her inebriation and examined it. A dark red rose. Its thorny branches stretched out from the rim of her empty teacup, the petals fresh and lively. Florence stared at the flower, utterly perplexed. She hadn't left it there. She didn't care for roses and never kept them in her apartment. Or did she? She couldn't remember, and so she giggled like a child. 
Wine did funny things to her memory. She caressed the stem in between her fingers and smelled the petals. A sweet, fruity aroma with hints of lemon. Her nostrils flared and she turned around to head back to the kitchen to do something, but she couldn't put her finger on what. The room wouldn't stop spinning and she felt nauseous. Stomach acid burst past her esophagus and into her throat. A fire erupted in her chest and she belched softly to quell the burn. Swallowing, she felt the acid trickle back down to where it belonged, taking her nausea with it. Her hand reached out and found the wall with its floral wallpaper. She leaned against it and dropped the rose down onto the carpet. She needed to get to bed and began to stagger down the hallway. The messy kitchen, still not cleaned up from dinner, went unnoticed. In fact, the thought would never cross her mind again. The hall leading to the bedroom was narrow and poorly lit, with ratty, dirt-stained carpet that was in desperate need of a good vacuuming. She kept these walls entirely bare, except for that same ugly floral wallpaper she had in the living room. She had always wanted to tear it down, but could never muster up the energy or commitment to see it through. Besides, it wasn't as if she'd be living here forever, so who cared what the walls looked like? As she reached the small, cell-like confines of her bedroom, she stripped off her sweater and plopped down into the unmade sheets without bothering to turn on a light. She pulled the wrinkled ball on top of her and groaned as her feet became uncovered. She kicked and squirmed until she felt her toes cocooned in warmth, then shut her eyes and drifted off to sleep. She's laying down somewhere, but she isn't sure where. She tries to lift her head, but can't move. She tries to lift her arms, but they're outstretched and pinned down. She feels a sharp sting in her left arm and is sure she got bit, but by who or what she does not know. The sun burns a hole into her eyes, so she closes them, more biting this time on her right arm. Miserable shouts all around her. She hears fresh vomit splash against muddy streets. Goats cry out and chickens squawk. She realizes she's in a wooden ox cart. The bumps in the road jerk her back and forth and the abhorrent smell lets her know where she is. A decaying arm flops in front of her face. She wants to scream, but her vocal cords won't make a sound. She is breathing, but it's labored and hanging on by a thread. Suddenly, the cart comes to a stop and she sees gloved hands begin pulling out corpses. She hears them flop onto the ground and she knows that's where she's going. Finally, the hands grab her, the grip harsh and unyielding. They tug at her arms and she's heaved out. She falls into a deep pit on top of a mountain of death. She catches a glimpse of a figure. A black mask with a large bird beak covers the face. The plank doctor chucks the last of the bodies and it lands on top of her with a thud. The air is pushed out of her lungs and they don't have the strength to fill again. With a dying exhale, she sees a lit torch in the man's hand as he lets it drop. Everything around her ignites and she becomes one with the flames. Florence suddenly awoke with a start, her heart ready to explode in her chest. She sat up and pressed a hand to her forehead. How long had she been asleep? She waited for her eyes to adjust to the darkness, and then squinted at the alarm clock next to her bed and read the hands. Three in the morning. She felt sickly warm, a fever coming on. Her back was drenched in a thin layer of sweat, and she felt unsettled. She couldn't place this feeling or justify to herself why she felt it but it gnawed at her. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she knew that something was amiss. She looked around the pitch-black bedroom, what had woken her up. Her ears perked at the dull hum of the overhead ceiling fan. That wasn't it. A chill ripped through her body. She rubbed her upper arms with clammy hands as she shook again. God, she felt awful. Her body ached and her heart throbbed. But why all this unease? Why were all these primal alarm bells ringing in the back of her mind? Suddenly a noise barely cutting through the whirring of the fan blades, a hardly perceptible scraping sound like a fingernail against wood. Florence straightened, trying to discern where the sound was originating from. She stood up weakly, flicked on the light, and surveyed the room. Her bed lay pressed against the wall with her dresser on the opposite wall. There was nothing else in the meager room. So where the hell was the sound coming from? It wasn't her dresser. She doubted she would have heard it lying in bed. The scratching got louder. She pressed her ear up against her headboard, 
The cheap plywood cracked and splintered. Yes, there, behind the headboard. It sounded like a small animal trying to burrow its way out of the wall. Or did it? She wasn't sure, but it sounded like claws digging into wood. Maybe a rat or other type of rodent. The sound grew in intensity, and she felt uncomfortable being in the same room. Then, the headboard jolted forward, shaking the bed. Florence let out a yelp and covered her mouth with her hand. Nothing made any logical sense, but every fiber of her being urged her to leave. Her body, still stiff and pain-stricken, she stooped and grabbed her sweater off the floor and shut the door behind her. I'll just sleep in the chair tonight, she thought to herself. The muffled scratching kept up. She made a mental note to tell the landlord about the sound. Hopefully he'd call an exterminator and could find whatever animal was causing all the ruckus. Her feet dug into the matted carpet as she heaved the sweater back over her shoulders, shivering as its heavy fibers cloaked her skin. She stopped as she reached the dark living room, feeling two large lumps on either side of her neck. Her fingers glided over them, and they felt tender and painful to the touch. They hadn't been swollen earlier, and this nibbled at the back of her unsettled mind. Great, just great, I'm, I'm getting sick, she groaned to herself. She dropped into her reading chair. As her arms drifted to her sides, she felt orange-sized lumps underneath each armpit. They felt like overfilled balloons ready to burst and stung something awful. Damn! She leaned her head back with a grimace, the rain doing its tap dance on the window. Overhead streetlights cast a warm yellow hue on the shiny, rain-covered asphalt. Florence stared out at the darkness. Motion pulled her vision down from the estate's garden. There down by the bushes, there was someone or something out there. Florence reached out to a side table and pulled on a lamp cord. She pressed her nose up against the glass. Dancing around one of those rose bushes was a circle of four young girls. They held hands to form a ring around the flowers. Their light blue dresses fluttered as they skipped along, their feet splashing up wet brown mud. Florence guessed them to be teenagers, maybe 16 years old her mind flashing back hours before to the young girl in her umbrella. Was she one of them? Florence doubted it, but the dresses looked familiar. Their long hair clung to their back and shoulders as the rain droplets continued to drench them. Florence craned her neck, pushing through the pain in her swollen lymph nodes, and watched them prance around, their legs becoming caked in the mud. The girl's mouths moved, but she couldn't read their lips. It looked like they were singing. What the hell? Florence's own mouth went dry and her heart resumed its breakneck pace. Her hands trembled as she unlocked the window hatch. Pushing the window open, blasted her forearm with rainwater, but she wanted to hear what the girls were saying. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. The old nursery rhyme. Florence hadn't heard it since she was a little girl back when her mother would sing it to her along with a host of others. As the girls ended their rhyme, they all flung themselves down onto the ground and began rolling around in the mud like pigs, covering themselves in layers of greasy earth. They began laughing and clutching their stomachs. Florence's brow furrowed and she felt drastically more sober. Young girls should not be out this late. It wasn't safe or proper. She pushed past the fear that had welled up within her and unlatched her window. Hey, excuse me. Florence leaned her head out of the window and shouted down to the ground. The girls stopped laughing. They gazed up at Florence with wide, surprised expressions. The girl, who seemed to be the leader of the group, spoke first. Hello, miss, she said through a mud-stained face. Florence thought she recognized the accent as Cockney, but couldn't be certain. Yes, hi, um, what do you think you girls are doing? Florence shouted, the rain slowing down to a trickle. Just having some fun, miss. Well, it's bothering me. You're worrying your parents, Florence said. She thought she sounded like a crotchety old woman. We don't have parents, the quartet chortled in unison. This chilled Florence, and she felt a rush of ice run down her neck and soothe the fire in her brain. Well, I'm trying to sleep. Go home or I'll call the police, Florence shouted. We don't know where home is, miss. Don't be smart with me, young lady. You need to leave or I'll call the police. She was about to slam the window shut, but was stopped cold by what the girl said next. Did you like your rose, miss? What? Florence's face contorted into shock. 
I picked you a nice big one. Did it smell nice? What? How did you... Your rose, Miss Florence. Did you like your rose? The joyful giggles chilled her. How did they know her name? She felt like she was losing it. Felt like her sanity was slipping out of her fingers. I... 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 She couldn't form words. One of the girls turned to the leader. I don't think she does. It's all right. She will soon. Another said. The group began to laugh harder in a sarcastic kind of tone when they know something you don't. She's dead anyways, the leader said through a giggle. Florence couldn't move. She was rooted by the window, paralyzed by fear. The girls skipped through the mud in a joyful procession, looking like mud-caked effigies. They looked back to wave as they disappeared into the London night. Florence slammed the window shut and locked it. A lump burst past Florence's throat, and she sagged against the windowsill and sobbed into her palms. She was burning up and felt exhausted. Breathing took immense effort and she needed to get back to sleep. Quickly composing herself, she pulled her moist hands away from her face and wiped her eyes. Feeling sorry for herself as her eyesight cleared, she caught a glance of her forearms in the dim lamp light and froze. Small red pockmarks lined her arms from her hands up to her elbows. They looked like bite marks. What the hell? She felt a tickle and a prick and then a flood of itchiness. The desire to scratch was maddening, so she began to run her fingernails across the sensitive skin, leaving white trail marks. Eventually, the white turned to a hot, angry red. The possibility of eczema flashed through her mind, yet she dismissed it. These weren't rashes. They were circular red dots with defined borders. Besides, she didn't have a history of skin conditions. Could it be bedbugs biting her? Maybe but it didn't explain the banging behind her headboard, and she sensed the two were connected. She didn't want to think about this right now. Exhausted, she lowered herself back into her chair and tried to push her worries aside, eventually falling asleep. The pit is black and smoldering with the scent of charred flesh. Smoke rises up from cremated ashes, but Florence's body remains. Her flesh is scorched and crusted over like burnt food. She doesn't hurt, but she can't move. If only she could move, then maybe she could get out of here. But alas, she is pinned down by the weight of the ashes. No, not just pinned down, but buried alive. She feels herself sinking into the pit, becoming enveloped in the fine, textured ash. It feels like smooth sand, and she tries to cry out, but it starts filling her mouth. She sees the four young girls approach and stand on the edge of the burn pit. They smile down at Florence. They're not wearing their regular old-fashioned dresses instead wearing all black. Long black bows are tied in their hair and run down their backs. They're dressed for a funeral. Florence's life flashes before her, one memory standing out. The night her father shoved her mother into an oven. The smell of her mother's flesh reminds her of the pit she's in now. Her father had used a bungee cord to keep the oven door closed as her mother roasted alive inside. Florence had hidden from her father under the bed and when her mother's agonized, barbaric screams became too much to bear, she shoved her fingers in her ears and cried to herself. Florence remembers the paramedics' faces, hands over heads, wheezy breaths, hunched over, gagging. Florence can't remember anything else. It was so long ago and too traumatic that somewhere along the way her brain buried the thoughts amongst the ashes. Florence jolts herself back and opens her eyes. The girls all cock their heads and morph their smiles into a malevolent grin. They're all evil, wicked grins, and it reminds Florence of her father's smile. Florence can't grasp what's happening. Why is she here? With ear-to-ear -ear grins, each girl retrieves a red rose, nibbles off a petal and drops each flower into the pit. Florence's eyes bulge out in terror as the sky above vanishes into nothing. She awoke to the sound of her phone ringing. She groaned and stood on shaky knees, the morning sun shining brightly through the window. Her head pounded from last night's binge drinking and she felt sicker than before. Hell, she felt like she got hit by a bus. Her muscles were tearing themselves apart and she felt an out-of-control fire rage inside her joints. She shook her head to clear out the nightmare's remnants, walked over to the side table where the phone was already blaring away, and picked up the receiver and put it to her ear. Hello? She said, her voice hoarse and frail. Florence, 
Florence, is that you? She didn't recognize the voice at first. Yes, who is this? This is Dorothy. I was worried about you. You were supposed to be here today. Oh, crap. Her boss. Florence had totally forgotten about work. Well, with the night she'd had, who could blame her? Are you alright, hon? You sound at death's door. Dorothy asked, her voice old and calming. I'm under the weather. Sorry, I was sleeping and forgot to call you. Are you coming? Florence let out a wheezy breath. I don't think so. Have you seen someone? You sound awful. No, I haven't. Would you like me to phone a doctor to come visit you? An uncontrollable shiver ripped through Florence's body and her shoulders convulsed. If you wouldn't mind, thank you. All right, I'll have someone come over. Are you still at the same place? Yes. Florence shut her eyes and her eyeballs felt like icicles. Okay, dear, I'll call them right away, Dorothy said. The doctor would never come. Florence hung up without saying goodbye. She decided on a shower. With great effort, she made it to the bathroom. Once inside, she perched on the toilet and tried to urinate, but nothing came. She sat there and waited, but still nothing. Then a stab of pain, an agonized screech. Florence doubled over in misery. Tears ran down her cheeks as pain exploded in between her legs. Blood began to run down her thighs and drip into the toilet like a leaky faucet. She screamed as she felt something sharp and hard push out of her and plop into the toilet bowl. She wanted to look and see what it was, but another hard object ripped through her. She closed her legs to stop the bleeding but one more agonized effort and yet another miniature knife blade. Florence couldn't catch her breath. The pain so immense in its excruciating mutilation that her brain threatened to shut off just to spare her the misery. When she mustered up the ability to scoop back, she looked down in the bowl, now stained a deep red crimson. Three large, bloody rose thorns floated in the water, some with fresh, pink chunks of flesh still attached. What was happening to her? Was she going mad? She flushed the toilet. What the hell is happening to me? Her panicked mind raced as she stood up in front of the mirror and patted her eyes. She lifted up her sweater to examine the rest of her body. She looked at herself in the mirror and screamed. Huge veiny purple clusters rose up from her flesh and pulsated. The splotches covered her stomach and chest and some areas looked black and decaying. The purple was the same dark shade as eggplant. She lifted a finger to poke at her rotting flesh, but her finger could only hover above it. She couldn't touch it. Some part of her brain refused to register that this was her skin, her body. It was some kind of foreign substance. Had to be. But the proof was right in front of her. And the pain. Dear God, the pain. She couldn't bear it. She hadn't felt it when she had first woken up, but now the agony was soul-sucking. She took the hand towel by the sink and bit down on it and screamed as loud as she could into it, tears welling in her eyes. She lowered her head and put her entire diaphragm into the whales. It all burst from her. Not just the mystery illness, but the loneliness, the despair, the stagnation, the insecurity, the grief, and every other awful thought and feeling she'd ever had. A lifetime of depression was expelled from her mouth and into the cloth. Florence had never known a human could make such sounds. She went on until her throat was raw and her voice was gone. When she had no more to let out, she spit out the slobbery towel into the sink and re-examined herself in the mirror. Her reflection was a caricature, an alien that she didn't recognize. She lifted her chin and saw the veins in her neck begin to bulge out. It was like worms were burrowed underneath her skin. What the hell was going on? She held out a hand and watched as her fingers moved on their own in jerky contractions. She couldn't make it stop and that terrified her. For the first time in her life, she couldn't control her own body. Why couldn't the suffering stop? Just for an instant, for a fraction of a second, that's all she wanted. To feel normal for one short, fleeting moment. To feel like how she did as a little girl. To be embraced in the warmth of her mother's arms. Mommy! She cried aloud, her fear regressing her mind to childhood. Mommy, please. She wanted her mother to walk through the door and hold her again like she had so long ago. Florence stood there, rocking back and forth on her heels, shivering and waiting for something to happen. 
Suddenly from across the hall she heard banging on her headboard. It was rhythmic and violent and she could hear the legs of the bed rise up and down with each jarring impact. She shut down, crashing down to the tiled bathroom floor with a thud. She couldn't find the energy to cry or sob. She just sat there, staring blankly into space with nothing else to give. She heard the wood on her headboard give way and explode into fragments that skidded on her bedroom floor, then rustling in multiple sets of footsteps. Florence looked up and lurched backwards. The four girls from outside her window were standing right in front of her. They encircled her in the small bathroom, with their hands clasped politely behind their backs in the same black outfits she had seen in her dream. What do you want from me? Florence's voice was a whisper. They speak in unison. You, silly. Why did you do this to me? We didn't. The fleas did. Is that what these are? Flea bites? Florence held up her arms, pointing to the small red bumps. Her upper arms were covered by black, pus-filled lesions. In your dream, you felt your arms get bit by something. That wasn't a dream, the leader of the group said. It was the fleas. They gave it to you. Gave me what? The Black Death. What? No, you're lying to me. Why would we lie? You've seen your flesh, it's rotting away. Why me? Florence shouted. Why, what have I ever done to you? Nothing, they giggled. But we need a fifth member. Florence's body turned to ice. What? I'm not joining you. Sure you are. You're almost dead. Cough and let it all out. Just a few more minutes and it'll all be over. No. Florence let out a raspy protest. I won't let you take me. You don't have a choice. We all died from the plague. That's how you join. Please help me. Don't do this. Florence pleaded. There were so many things she hadn't done. Her heart ached at the loss. Well, maybe there is something. The girls began reaching up their hemlines again, this time cupping something in their hands. A pocket full of posy. They blew, scattering the flowers over Florence's face. Once Florence's body was covered in the colorful petals, the leader spoke. Why do you think you were named Florence? What? In Latin, Florence means to bloom. Your fate has been determined since you were born. No, you're lying. You keep saying that, but it's not true. Besides your mother, you dreamt about her, didn't you? How did you know? We can influence dreams. You'll learn all about it soon. She had the plague too, that's how she died. No, you're lying. She was burned alive in a damn oven. Her body, yes, but the screams you heard was her suffering from what you have now. Your father kept the plague from spreading to you by burning her body. He was delaying the inevitable. You could have been with us so much younger. But why do you want me? Florence asked. Your mother wants to see you. My, my m mom? What? She's here? Where? Florence looked around frantically. You can't see her yet. You will in time. No, I want to see her now. Using her last bit of strength, she stood and pushed past the girls and into the hall. Mom, Mom, where are you? Florence shrieked. There is a way to speed this up. The leader pushed past Florence, bent over and picked up the rose that Florence had dropped on the floor. The girl perched herself in Florence's reading chair and held the rose up to her. Eat the petals, the girl said. Why? Don't you want to see your mother again? The girl asked. The other three stood behind Florence. She looked into the girl's eyes and saw something lurking behind them. A hunger, a deception. You're lonely, they said. You can be with us. We'll be your friends. I want my mother. They need the rose. You'll see her, I promise. With a shaky hand, Florence took the rose and shoved it into her mouth. The petals tasted sweet and waxy and began to melt in her mouth like a piece of chocolate. The girl's mouth twisted into a gleeful expression. She clapped victoriously as the room began to spin around Florence. Her arms burst through the ceiling splattering the floor with bits of drywall and stucco. Florence tried to scramble away, but the girls held her in place, each of them controlling an arm or a leg. More arms now, some reaching from the walls and others grabbing at her ankles from the floor. Each limb was black and looked like a plague victim. Florence was too weak to fight them off and the sea of hands entangled her, pulling her through a hole in the floor. Florence screamed but didn't hear it. A flash of light bloomed in her vision until she saw nothing but blackness. 
She awakens and knows that this isn't a dream. The world around her is red and feels sluggish, like she's floating around a bowl full of gelatin. It's her childhood home. She recognizes the living room with its shag carpet and roaring fireplace. She looks around and hears that familiar content humming, and it melts her heart. It's her mother. Yes, her mom. She runs in the direction of the sound, but she isn't getting any closer. She puts more effort into it, but is running in place. She can't move, and then she realizes that she's stuck, her arms entangled in vines. She tries to scream, but can't. Her vocal cords won't work. A silhouette passes in front of her. It's her mother. Florence tries to reach out and touch her, but she is tied down, unable to move. She tries shouting again, but it's useless. Her mother can't hear her. Then, as suddenly as she was sucked into this world, she feels herself being dragged out. She can do nothing to stop it. Florence shakes her head and finds herself in a strange place. She looks down and is surprised about her appearance. It's a black dress and she's sure it isn't hers. She feels something strange in her hair and she reaches back and feels the smooth satin bow. Florence looks up and sees that she's standing in a circle with the girls. Why am I dressed like you guys? Florence asks. You're dressed for a funeral. Whose funeral? Place your rose. Florence sees a gravestone jutting out from the grass and she reads the name engraved on it. Florence Ellis, 1936 to 1965. A loving daughter. A ring of roses encircles the site, and Florence adds hers to complete the tribute. You're one of us now, the girl says. What about my mom? Florence asks. You won't miss her. You know what? What, what you're doing here is wrong. I don't want you to be a part of this anymore. The psychiatrist stared past the observation glass at the patient inside. The doctor beside him in a white lab coat. His arms were crossed over his chest and he worked on a lit pipe that occasionally puffed out smoke. Why? It's not working as intended? The doctor asked. The psychiatrist shook his head grimly. She drew me a picture today. Oh, what was it? Her gravestone. She thinks she was born in 1936. Well, that's not entirely unusual. The drugs will take some time to work out, but I think we will see marked improvements in the long term. She was already a paranoid schizophrenic before she came here. Giving her hallucinogens is just asking for trouble. Damn, she's practically dissociative. Well, there will be a trial and error in any medical experiment, but we are making discoveries every day. I've already told you, a safe drug that simulates virtual reality will be absolutely groundbreaking. What is she saying now? That I made her eat flowers and how she misses her mother. She insists that there is something behind her headboard making scratching sounds, but she's the one doing it. If she keeps it up, she'll have no fingernails left, he said with a sigh. The doctor shook his head. Does she still have that bubonic plague she was screaming about? No, she thinks she's died. She drew me a gravestone. The psychiatrist said. The doctor chuckled. This isn't funny. She's convinced that she's being haunted by those four girls. You mean the quadruplet twins that we had her visit with? The doctor asked. Yes. I urged you not to let the patients intermingle, but you wouldn't listen to me. Why are those four committed again? They claim they're witches and that they can curse people. Ah, uh, yes, I remember. How is their treatment going? They seem calmer on the placebo than they did on the control, he said. Remember that episode they had a few months back? The one where they broke into your office? The doctor asked. Yes, he said impatiently. That one. Yeah, we haven't let them back outside ever since they left that rose in Florence's room. It freaked Florence out, and in my opinion, this psychotic episode she's been experiencing. The doctor nodded approvingly. You're a good man. The doctor smacked him on the back. You'll keep taking your notes. The doctor began walking away, but the psychiatrist stopped him. If Florence's mother ever found out what we're doing to her daughter while she's in our care, we'll be ruined. Who? Dorothy. Florence's mother. She called me yesterday to Strat. She said Florence didn't even recognize her over the phone. She had a gibberish conversation and she said something about how Florence thought she was sick and had to call off work. In my professional estimation, we need to take Florence off the hallucinogens immediately. We're on thin ice here and I recommend introducing her to clozapine with regular blood monitoring. Stephen, the doctor said turning back, this is an assisted living facility. But in reality, you work in an asylum. That's what this place is. 
I don't like sugarcoating things. Dorothy signed the paperwork. She gave us the ability to give her daughter experimental drugs to give her shock therapy and to do whatever I see fit to make her well. Now, if you don't want to strike it rich, that's your problem, not mine. She didn't read the paperwork and that's her problem, not mine. Now, if you don't mind, I have work to do. The doctor walked out of the small room, leaving Stephen alone with his thoughts. He turned back, staring at the young woman in the room. She danced around in a circle, holding hands with people who weren't there. That's the end of the story. I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, consider liking the video and subscribing, or just letting me know in the comments what you thought. If you're on the podcast or wherever else, I'm not sure what your options are, but I appreciate you for listening nonetheless. And again, a huge shout out for uh, to my patrons for helping make this episode possible. Your support and generosity is appreciated more than you know. Aside from all that, there is a Discord if you'd like to come join. I would love to see you there just to come chat and hang out. Could use some friends there. And um, if you'd like to send me your story, you can go to storiesaftermidnight.com where there will be a link to do so. And uh, you can see your story featured on the channel. So with all that said, I really thank you for joining and we'll see you in the next one.